uh, sticking to the time and for that wonderful uh, exposition on this Quark Maya. Uh, indeed, you have uh, given run through the entire uh, developments during the last many years in that span of 25 minutes in a very succinct manner, which all of us have understood uh, that things are not very bright. And at the same time, there are scopes for hopes to, uh, to get into the betterment. Ma'am, I've seen uh, quite a few uh, uh, seniors uh, who have been dealing with this uh, region as well as with this subject directly or indirectly for the last many years. And uh, uh, I will take this leverage to ask uh, some of them to uh, uh, raise their queries or suggestions or observations with regard to the talk you have just delivered. I would begin by uh, requesting uh, Sanjay sir, uh, who has been dealing with this subject uh, for uh, several years. Uh, if he has any queries with regard to what you have just mentioned or any other suggestions that you would like to give. Sanjay sir, please. Uh, thank you, Albaik. Uh, Meena, that was a brilliant tour de force on Shah Bahar. I have, uh, I'll just make a few comments uh, to set the conversation going. Firstly, we must, uh, Shah Bahar is an Iranian port. It is a strategic Iranian port. It is the port which gives them access to the open sea beyond the Hormuz. So that is the advantage of Shah Bahar beyond Bandar Abbas. Secondly, Shah Bahar is located in Baluchistan and development of a port there will help the hinterland Baluchistan, which is underdeveloped, developing faster. Having said that, I must also say, add that Iran has to decide how to use the strategic position as a possible connectivity hub for regions all around it. Using Shah Bahar and itself as a connectivity hub is of the greatest advantage to Iran. Obviously, it's of advantage to others who will make use of the connectivity corridors. And that was the logic of the in, uh, India North South, uh, International North South Transport Corridor. So, Iran has the possibility of linking markets in Europe, Russia, Central Asia with those in the Gulf. And the prize is the Indian market. So that is the basic central point of the Indian involvement in Shah Bahar, because it gives a huge market to link with another huge market in the north. And to that is linked the various agreements, such as the Ashgabad Agreement, which links up Central Asian railways with Iran and Oman. You have the Central Asian Railway Network, if all these things start going, it helps develop industries and projects along the links. Now, there is already a train running from Lahore to Ankara, which is called the Economic Cooperation Organization train. But it has not been very successful because it misses out the main market on the eastern hub, which is India. The so Indian involvement in Shah Bahar ensures a market and a place, a supplier of goods and services. And therefore, it's of advantage to India and of great advantage to Iran. And final word, just uh, everybody knows that things take time whenever India is involved. But that is because India's whole philosophy of doing projects is completely different. It is consultative. It allows every stakeholder to take ownership of projects so that it ensures its longevity. Therefore, Indian projects, whenever they are done in Africa, whenever they are done in uh, any other part of the world, have long lasting effects and have shown the test of time. And I think our involvement in Shah Bahar will be of similar nature. Because yes, there is a logic to the development of Shah Bahar port for Iran, for India, and the markets beyond. 
be it Afghanistan, be it Central Asia, be it Russia, and be it Europe, or be it the Gulf itself. So I thank you very much for asking me to intervene. I'll write, I hope I have given some food for thought. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Ma'am, you would like to respond to some of the observations? Uh, well, uh, what Sir has said, actually, you know, he's highlighted the, you know, trade and economic advantages, which I said, it is important, you know, when I say the developmental uh, diplomacy or developmental, uh, you know, that narrative that we have, and India has, has taken that that way, you know, uh, it is not, you know, like China, you know, where you want to impose certain conditions you know, you want your labor to go there, you want your stuff to be bought. So that is the uniqueness of India's engagement. And therefore, India is different. Uh, so I think I endorse what he has said. And uh, it actually, uh, that's, that's the reason. But as I said, you know, today, you know, even he knows it, uh, the, the freight forwarder, the gentleman who's dealing with the, the uh, Chabar, and, uh, you know, they are the ones who are doing the real business. And let me say, it is just not the Indians, even the Afghan traders, you know, they have come up and said that, you know, this is so useful for us uh, because it saves them a lot of problems that they have faced while using the Karachi airport. And that, that experience, I, I personally interacted with some of the Afghans while I was in Kabul, you know, uh, on, on how difficult Pakistan had made it for them to actually use the Karachi port. And these are the people, you know, they, they are, uh, I mean, I don't know how to define Taliban. That's a big, uh, you know, sort of debate again, you can get into it. But they are the Pashtuns, you know, who I spoke to. Uh, and this is why Chabahar gives them a golden opportunity to trade uh, with India and, uh, you know, with the Central Asians, with Iran. I mean, there's, there's a huge potential. Uh, let's hope that, you know, it, it, uh, the, the full potential, uh, we uh, collectively are able to realize the full potential of it. Uh, I think the, the point here, what is not being explained very clearly, nobody knows as to what would it mean if they go and invest. Uh, because certain explanations need to come from the government about what are, uh, what are the exemptions that you have on Chabahar. That's not very clear. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, may I also request Professor Joe, uh, sitting in Lebanon, to ask uh, some questions to ma'am. Professor Joe, yeah. Well, uh, I actually have a kind of very simple question. Uh, and uh, as uh, Ambassador Singh just said, Shah Bahar is in Baluchistan, and uh, it has not been developed by the Iranians precisely because it was not Persia. And all of a sudden, foreign powers, whether it's India or China or any other country, is supposed to come in and develop this place, whereas the city and the entire province, of course, fits entirely inside Iran itself. What prevented the Iranians from actually developing Shah Bahar all these years? Why do we need someone else to come in and invest billions of dollars to do what you're supposed to do yourself? I don't mean to be uh, pejorative uh, in this. I'm just asking a question of ownership here. Uh, now, you, uh, Professor Mina, has described very eloquently the problems that Shah Bahar faced as a city. But could you perhaps please elaborate on the responsibilities of the Iranian governments over the years for failing to actually do what they're supposed to do? Okay. Can I? Should yes, I please. answer or take more questions and then answer? Oh, I think you can go ahead, ma'am. Okay. Now, I think you, you've asked a very important question and your question, you know, takes me back to uh, India, Russia cooperation and why despite Russia being an hub of the energy resources, we had no 
uh, you know, deal with them at that time. But here for Iran, I think, uh, as you said, it was in Balochistan and they never felt the need of it. And more importantly, I think the focus was more on you know, other issues rather than developing the Chabahar port. They didn't realize it till then. Till, you know, uh, you know, and more importantly, they were under sanctions. Uh, where was the money? Money was all being pumped into ensuring the strategic assets that they have. They have. You know, that uh, the focus was more to ensure their influence in the region. Uh, that was one. More importantly, I don't think, you know, they had enough resources, uh, you know, to invest in Chabahar. That was, I think, the primary reason why uh, they were looking at the regional uh, actors or the international uh, actors to come and invest and develop uh, the Chabahar uh, port. Uh, and they had Bandar Abbas, you know, they had other ports which were operational. The, the importance of Chabahar was realized when I also uh, feel that the Gwadar came up. You saw, you know, the the kind of the geopolitics uh, which took certain shape, and I think it also, as I said, you know, this was all about the economic integration, about the connectivity drive, and that is when they realized the worth of Chabahar, and they also realized that perhaps the external actors would come and invest, since it is, uh, you know, important and it's a it's it's a, a strategic port. Uh, initially, I think the focus was somewhere else, developing itself as a as a more powerful nation to manage the uh, you know their isolation, also to you know enhance their influence in the uh, the uh, Middle East region probably. So that is where, and of course, developing you know their own uh, uh, military uh, capabilities. So I think that the the security part took priority over the developmental issues. Uh, that would be my answer to question and I hope uh, I have uh, satisfied uh, you in, in, in whatever little I understand about them. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, may I also request Professor Tanaka from Japan uh, to uh, pose some questions to ma'am. Japan being also a partner for Iran on several issues, including energy. Uh, Professor, please. Thank you so much. Uh, could you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, right. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had the pleasure and honor to um, address the similar issue regarding India, Japan, and Iran trilateral uh, cooperation or possible cooperation on the uh, development of Chabahal and the railroad towards Central Asia and beyond. Uh, my understanding, uh, my humble understanding here is that uh, for the Iranians, uh, they had multiple uh, projects ongoing uh, in the early 2000s. It was not only about Chabahal, it was about Kish, it was about Kish, when they were proceeding with their so-called free trade zones. Uh, in their land. Yes. And that prevented, I mean, actually had, having a multiple project with the same uh, intent or similar intention that uh, simultaneously actually would not work. And I believe it's not only about the strategic interest of Iran, I mean, putting priority over their military and others that had prevented uh, the, uh, say, lagging uh, behind the Chabahal. I believe that it could have been the reason that they were not concentrating on Chabahal. Despite the uh, say, um, despite the rhetoric that they considered that port and the possible railroad connection to Central Asia and even to Afghanistan would have uh, say boosted their regional um, say uh, advantage and status. And I just like one, uh, just like uh, I mean, uh, knowing that you have been similarly uh, following the issue or even more extensively than I have been. Um, this mean, I'd like to see your views on how the Iranian strategy itself had been working or had been, say, uh, disappointing us uh, at all. Sorry, how Iranian strategy is disappointing? Has, has been working, has been working or that has been uh, actually been disappointing for all of us. On Chabahar or on, the, on Chabahar or in the region, uh, or okay. I mean any sort of a regional context. Okay, as far as Iran's, uh, you know, reach. 
institutional uh, strategies are concerned. Uh, I can give you the Indian perspective on this, you know. Please. Uh, we, uh, I, I, I don't know how Japan looks at it, but from India's point of view, uh, in terms of region, we, I personally, my own interaction with the Iranians and whatever, for India, Iran, as I said, is an important country when we are talking about the region. So I have always felt that Iran did not, uh, you know, probably was not recognized uh, in as a regional power. And that is what they have been, uh, you know, striving for. That is one. The other uh, thing which actually, you know, I, and I have said this on the Iranian television interview also, that when we're talking about the Iran's regional strategies, although they have changed over the years, uh, but uh, the bottom line has been to sustain Iranian influence, uh, basically to, uh, to uh, mitigate the uh, negative impact of the sanctions on them. And to do that, they have got into engaging with, you know, these assets like Hamas and Hezbollah, which, you know, the people who are working uh, on this side of the, 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 uh, the world, we have always said this is something they need to explain, you know. Uh, this is something which has been disturbing. Uh, there are other, you know, issues which have been raised uh, by a lot of Indians, you know, uh, that you need to explain your regional strategies when to the smaller states. It's been a big power, small power syndrome when we talk about the region. And Iran is, of course, uh, a, a, a country which the other smaller countries feel threatened. For example, whether we talk about Oman, whether we talk about Qatar, nobody wants to, you know, have, uh, you know, kind of confrontation with Iran. It is, it is practically not possible given the strength that the Iranians have. Uh, so on the regional, uh, you know, thing, I think they have disappointed uh, when you see their involvement with, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the uh, groups, uh, especially the, the network of the uh, extremist groups, which, you know, has been more objectionable. As far as India is concerned, you know, India was always against, uh, you know, Iran going nuclear. Uh, but when it comes to the civil nuclear, uh, you know, power, that is what is any country's right. That's been our position. But Iran's involvement in the regional uh, affairs or meddling with the, uh, you know, internal affairs of the other countries is something which, which has been raised uh, when you read the uh, writings uh, within India as well. So that's been questioned. And there are no answers to it. The only answer that you get from there, if you are isolated, if you are, you know, cornered, then obviously, you know, you would formulate certain strategies would, would strengthen you uh, in a way which cannot be challenged. So this is what I, I feel when uh, we are talking about the Iranian strategies. But have they been successful? So far, I would say, you know, despite the, uh, the U U.S. sanction, despite the economic crisis, uh, the Iranian diplomacy, the Iranian, you know, uh, negotiating skills and their, you know, uh, strength of uh, surviving uh, in, such a, in such a situation is commendable. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is something which, uh, you know, actually drives you to think, uh, can you really ignore a country like Iran? And what are the real reasons that Iran has been, you know, engaged in certain activities which are objectionable? Now, is it because Iran was not recognized or you have various factions within the Iranian? Iranian system is pretty complicated. I mean, if we get into it, we know if you talk to the people, you know, the public opinion is very different. I mean, today, if you talk to the younger lot there, they want to, they are highly Eurocentric, you know, they want better relations with Europe, they want better relations with United States. And let me tell you tomorrow, for whatever reasons, we don't know, if uh, the, the, uh, if the relationship uh, improves between Iran and the United States, Asia will not be the focus. Asia would only remain focused because the energy demand is here, market is here. So that will keep, 
keep their engagement with Asia, but otherwise they would prefer to, uh, you know, be with the Europeans and the Americans rather than with the Asians. That is my take on it. Thank you, ma'am. May I also request uh, Gushan, ma'am, if ma'am is here. If... Yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Mr. White. Yes, ma'am. And thank you so much, Meena. You were good as always. Very clearly, you brought out the problems, but you also pointed out the potentials in our bilateral ties. May I also ask you to add your prescription at our end as to how this potential can be materialized to some extent. Well, uh, ma'am, I have, I have uh, you know, normally people see me as pro-Iran uh, person. Uh, but I've always tried to argue and tell that, you know, I am pro-India. Uh, neither I'm pro-Iran nor pro-anything, I'm pro-India and that's what my job is. So, uh, as you said, ma'am, how do we take this relationship forward given the potential? I think here I have, I have uh, said many times that we need to work out United States and United States relations with Iran will continue to shadow our relations with Iran. So India is the only country which can manage it because it has good ties with both the countries. And with the Iranians, there's a huge issue of the expectations. And that was quite high, I would say, about eight years back. But gradually, you know, they have understood that India needs to get access to the uh, better technology. India needs to get, you know, access to... Uh, better markets, better, you know, uh, cooperation with other countries. So that has uh, been a change. But here, I would say without harming, there's a huge potential when we are talking about uh, the, uh, the, the, the economic uh, ties with Iran. Chabahar, I, I said in case of Chabahar, a lot of positives are there. Now, you know, they, they, there are some issues, for example, you know, there are few technical issues which are still pending with the Iranians. So they have to come forward. The bureaucracy in Iran is equally difficult, as I said. So they also have to uh, walk extra mile to ensure that India does it. For India, despite the challenges, I think the smaller, uh, you know, companies can be created. And, you know, little more support from the government uh, needs to be, uh, you know, uh, given to these small group of, uh, you know, traders. Uh, in fact, uh, the Freight Forwarders Association uh, people have told me that they approached the shipping ministry saying they, they could be given some loan to, you know, buy a smaller ships. Uh, that would be very, very easy for them to, because there are no stakes when you're talking about the United States, no implications as far as the, the sanctions are concerned, no dollar uh, sort of issues involved. And that is something which can help them do the business with, uh, with uh, Iran and use the Chabahar uh, port. This, these are some. Uh, when we are talking about, uh, you know, the, now our oil, uh, you know, imports are zero. Now that gave us, because we had some uh, money in balance in our banks here. So you could, you could manage some, some kind of uh, engagement with them. Uh, today, again, you know, the, uh, there are many areas, for example, the Zanjang province where I've traveled, the fruits, uh, the uh, smaller, you know, businessmen are already there. I met a couple of them there. So there are many options when we are talking about engaging Iran uh, in economic terms in trade. So smaller businessmen, you know, can do it. But if we are expecting, you know, bigger companies like Reliance and Tata's, Mahindra's and Adani's and Ambani's, they will not do it because their stakes are very high uh, in Europe and United States. But these smaller companies, you know, smaller firms can be encouraged to do business with them. This, this, is, uh, this is the only way out uh, for now. Thank you, ma'am. 
Uh, Ma'am, I've just received a question from Mr. Barak from Israel. Uh, if, if Mr. Barak is present here, you may ask the question directly, Mr. Barak, or if you want me to answer, uh, ask, Ma'am. You may, yeah, please, please. Yeah. This, sub this subject is new for me, but uh, I read in the Israeli media that uh, the Iran, Iran, China, and also Russia, they established uh, a joint base for collecting intelligence in, the, in this port. So I was wondering what is the Indian pr perspective on this, on this uh, issue? Uh, well, I really don't know how um, uh, authentic uh, this report is, uh, but I can only tell you that uh, the, even if you read uh, the Iranian media, yes, uh, Iran, Russia, uh, and you know, China, they have conducted the uh, military drill you know, in 2019. Uh, that is one, but knowing the Iranians, I don't think they would uh, give in to the Chinese and the Russians. Uh, they are uh, they are uh, they are not the type who would like to surrender their sovereignty to either Russia or China. I mean, until unless they are driven to the corner where there are no options left for them. So I would have some apprehensions about the Iranians giving that kind of a, you know, uh, opportunity or space to either China or Russia to collect intelligence. Uh, maybe Russians, I would say, uh, to an extent, but uh, Chinese definitely not. But I really don't know. I, I don't know what is the source, but uh, given my understanding about the Iranians, they are very, very uh, uh, particular about, you know, uh, uh, their own sovereignty and they would not like the uh, other players to come and uh, interfere. Some joint intelligence on counter-terrorism or some uh, maritime issues uh, could be a possibility. Thank you. I, I put uh, the link to the, this article on the chat if you want to see. Okay. We still have some more time uh, if anybody has any query. Uh, uh, Professor Pan was here, but I have not seen him on the screen right now. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please. Uh, please. Yes, please, Mudasir, please. Uh, thank, thanks a lot, ma'am. I, I have been, you know, I mean, kind of gaining a lot of insights from ma'am, uh, interacting quite often on several issues, obviously. But, you know, given the talk and I thought uh, it would be interesting to just, you know, just to provoke you a bit uh, yes. and ask you this question, because, I mean, there is U.S. factor, obviously, but then if we look at the current developments, especially in terms of India's relations with Israel and India's relations with Saudi Arabia and UAE and the, and the regional, you know, the, the way evolving situation is in the region, I think for India, it could be not just the U.S. factor, but also the Israel and Gulf factor, which will be difficult to handle as far as Iran is concerned. So perhaps you can give us some ideas on that. I think, you know, if you look at uh, our policy, even in past, you know, it is not that UAE, Israel are the new factor for us. You know, it's they've been there. The Saudi, the UAE, the Israeli factors have always been there. But we've been able to balance it out uh, in a better way. Uh, it is Mr. Trump, you know, and, you know, his policies and, you know, increasing pressure, you know, uh, on Iran, which created certain uh, situation. And, of course, our growing cooperation with the United States. That has made it much more difficult for us uh, to actually, you know, uh, do that balancing act. Despite all that, I would say, even now, you know, we've been able to sustain that relationship. And I think that would be uh, our uh, probably effort to ensure that we, you know, don't disengage with a country like Iran. And that will not happen. I, I don't uh, foresee, you know, that kind of a situation because of Afghanistan, because of Iran's certain potential. We are also waiting uh, to see as to how Iran-U.S. relationship would develop. What happens after November, we don't know. Uh, you know, this, as I said, you know, this region is full of strategic surprises. And how, you know, the U.S.-Iran relations are going to unfold, that would either complicate 
uh, you know, further uh, maintaining our ties with Iran or it will, you know, help us ease out certain uh, places where we can move ahead faster. Uh, regardless of the sanction, I think we will continue to stay engaged with Iran, as I said in past, in whatever possible ways we can do it. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, yes. Can I request Professor Kumar for me, ma'am? Uh, I think uh, Professor Tanaka wants to ask. He just raised his. Okay, good, good. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Thank you. I'm sorry to ask for the second term. Uh, now, a uh, quick question is uh, how do you see the current situation involving in Afghanistan? Now, India has a possible only ra uh, land route via uh, Chabahal will be critical for uh, uh, India, a country like India, to uh, maintain access to Afghanistan through the land. Now, um, now it's seeing that the Taliban is negotiate, has negotiated a sort of a deal with the Americans and that the Afghan government is in trouble now trying to um, to balance their growing influence inside the country. Now, uh, if the Chabahal port is, well, um, and also the railroad project is left in limbo, now how would India see the strategic role of Pakistan as, or Pakistan's influence growing once again inside Afghanistan? Wouldn't that consider a sort of a threat, a new threat to uh, India's own security and economic interests? I think we've had a history of dealing with Pakistan and I've always said Pakistan has its nuisance value. And that's not going to go away uh, as far as, uh, you know, uh, the region is concerned. Uh, as far as Afghanistan is concerned, you know, Afghans, as I told you, you know, even during my short visit of some five, six days in Afghanistan, uh, you know, traveling from Kabul to uh, Panshi, all people that I met, you know, everybody is fed up with the violence uh, which is happening including the Pashtun. Yes, the Pakistan has livers uh, as far as Afghanistan is concerned and there is very little that, you know, you can do. But I don't think Afghanistan is going to go back to uh, what it was, uh, you know, before 9-11. People want a progress. People want, even if you look at women, you know, there have been some changes. Now, nobody wants Afghanistan to fail. Uh, I'm not saying things are going to change overnight. Pakistan will continue to, uh, you know, make use of uh, it is its its uh, uh, you know presence in and its hold over them. But ultimately, when we talk about Chabahar, it is uh, even if it is uh, you know let's say if it's Taliban, they would want good relations. They would want the economy to flourish. They would want certain uh, you know improvement uh, in terms of getting revenues and trade. I mean that we might face some difficulties, but I don't think, you know, Pak I mean, uh, the, the kind of changes that people are speculating, uh, you know, would completely change the whole scenario. I think it would be manageable and even the international actors would not uh, like Afghanistan to go back to what it was, uh, you know, uh, before 9-11. So uh, China itself, and I think the CPEC and Chinese uh, you know, uh, wanting, you know, Afghanistan, you know, to join CPEC. So China would also, if you re talk to the Chinese today, there was a time when the Ch Chinese refused to talk about Afghanistan. But today, I think Afghanistan is a factor when when they are talking about the, the security dynamics as such. Yes, Pakistan will have, it will, you know, try its best. But uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, those are the things uh, not, uh, you know, under anybody's control, but we will see uh, some changes. How it is going to unfold, I really don't know, you know. I mean, that is something to wait and watch at the moment. We will, um, we are having uh, Mr. Abdullah Abdullah here. The peace tower talks are on in, in Doha. So I think some kind of a mechanism will, uh, will come up where, uh, you know, they would, uh, they would not want, you know, that kind of a violence. And what is going to be the give and take amongst the Afghans is also very, very important. And I'm sure the Americans don't want, you know, uh, Afghanistan to, to be uh, completely uh, out of control uh, as far as 
you know, those uh, negative forces are concerned. And so would Russia, I don't think even the Russians would want. So there are common interests uh, as far as Afghanistan is concerned when we are talking about China, when we are talking about US, when we are talking about uh, Iran also. And, but still we don't see sort of a cooperation amongst those uh, interested parties. There would be selected <laughs> cooperation, I will tell you. Uh, there is no regional cooperation that has worked in past and will work uh, now, but it would be uh, it would be a selected uh, cooperation, and that's what I feel. Uh, it's Thank not you. going to be uh, some kind of a regional mechanism where everybody will benefit, but it would be selected uh, kind of a uh, engagement. That's how I look at it, ma'am. We are already. Two past five. Can I just ask uh, so, uh, my senior Chitra to ask a question? And she raised her hand. If you have time for that. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Right. I'm a speaker, right. so I have to answer. Chitra, ma'am, please. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for giving us a detailed uh, Indian perspective on the Chapar uh, uh, uh Looking at the uh, project, which was incepted a decade before, and um, Iran being. Um, uh, and, uh, dropping the uh, already agreed project with India, for, for example, the Farzad B gas project and the uh, Chabhar to uh, Zahdin rail line projects. So they have already uh, dropped this, citing uh, delays in funding from India. So if we are going to delay in uh, uh, developing this uh, deep uh, port of uh, Chabhar, uh, and along with the, the five country, proposed five country alliance with Turkey, Russia, China, and uh, Pakistan, how do I, uh, how do we see? Would there be any strain between uh, in Iran and India's relationship because of dropping of uh, the earlier projects and delay in this uh, Chabhar uh, port? Because already uh, Iran is uh, completely dependent on UAE for this uh, deep uh, port for all the trade uh, uh, stuffs. How do you see, ma'am? Well, first of all, India has not been dropped uh, from the Chaba Zaidan project. Uh, as I said, the new contract has, I mean, it has been, uh, it is something, you know, as I said, everybody is going to wait till uh, November. Uh, and the process is on, you know, and as I, as I said in my presentation also, so Iranian, you know, statements uh, have also said that they haven't dropped India, but they are going ahead with it because there was a delay from Indian side. So it is not you want to join, you can join. It is all up to you. Uh, so India has not been dropped, number one. Factually, that is not right. And there are official statements to support this. You can, uh, you can read it. I have uh, written uh, on our IDSA website, you can read that. Uh, second, you know, as I said, on the regional uh, sort of um, groupings that you see, uh, Professor Tanaka also said, you know, what will happen in Afghanistan. So you will see, you know, uh, trilateral cooperation, you would see bilateral, you would see quadrilateral cooperation on, on issues which are, uh, you know, of interest for those, con those uh, countries. But how the, the global... Uh, you know, geopolitics uh, or the uh, alliances, or not actually alliances, but the groupings, how they would come up, what would be the situation after November as to how US-China relations are going to, to shape, how, you know, US-Russia relations are going to shape. Is there going to be more concentration or cooperation? We really don't know. Uh, so lot will depend, I would say, you know, when we are looking at these, but regionally China is, uh, is, is following an extremely aggressive uh, approach and, you know, they are trying to do every possible uh, effort uh, to ensure the success of, uh, you know, BRI uh, and therefore, you know, engaging all the regional actors and also to, to counter, you know, their concentration with, uh, with the United States. So India-Iran relations are going to, you know, I call it, we will be, we are on the bumpy road right now. So probably uh, we will have to see what is the political will at this end and how, uh, how things are going to unfold uh, even in regionally. I see new Middle East 
today you know after these uh, agreements which were signed uh, between uh, uae and israel between bahrain and israel i think the new uh, uh, the, the new developments do indicate some kind of a change in the regional dynamics as such and uh, people would be more focused on you know addressing the economic issues addressing the developmental issues and uh, the economic crisis which is unfolding uh, i mean because of the covid i think everybody wants some sort of an engagement uh, with uh, with their partner countries those who can help them grow so that uh, i think uh, economic diplomacy would uh, continue to be uh, one important factor which would drive the relationship uh, cooperation in science and technology in cyber in other ai and other uh, i guess uh, areas would would be more important factors ma'am we have the last question from dr nancy yeah dr nancy please ah uh, thank you albert uh, uh, good evening ma'am uh, i met you it's been almost 9 uh, years way back when uh, kumara swami sir called for a book release and uh, whenever i think about iran if you want to know something about jabahar we you know the immediate uh, search in the internet is minarising article so you are continuously following this jabahar uh, uh, port and its development in that particular area mom i would like to you know it's a kind of clarification because uh, when you look at the trilateral relationship between india russia and iran and all these three countries have a very good relationship a friendly relationship compared to the other countries as such and three of them have joined various projects and they were trying to work on this project but recent uh, the sea route which signed between russia and india uh, chennai to vladivostok do you think this will be an alternative kind of development which is happening uh, india iran jabahar and uh, russia india vladivostok sea route does it make any difference in the chabahar development which is happening recently now because no, no. i don't think there is any connection between uh, india russia cooperation to that uh, between india iran afghanistan chabahar uh, cooperation as such there is only uh, linkage when we are talking about uh, you know larger uh, international north south transport corridor and chabahar becomes a part of it uh beyond that i would i mean you are saying the trilateral cooperation between india iran and russia and uh, i you know if you compare it with past there there are a lot of changes that have happened uh what we see today is a growing you know uh, engagement between russia and pakistan we also see growing engagement between russia and china uh despite both of them being uh, uh, competing on on when we we come to the energy uh, issue and even otherwise you know in the in the larger eurasian uh, <clears throat> uh area there there is a competition you know china is china has taken uh you know much has gone much beyond what russia can offer to the eurasian uh, region so there are there is competition but there is also cooperation because of the us strategy to uh, you know see russia and uh, and uh, and china as a major uh, you know uh, uh, threat and challenge when it comes to the larger, larger um, uh, security uh, strategy when we come so india iran india iran and russia uh, uh, india russia cooperations are of course Uh, on a different uh, scale today we can't you know we can't go back to that old thing of india iran russia thing where we work together uh, you know along with the afghans and central asians so those equations have changed today i would say and there are new uh, you know areas of cooperation new alignments which you see so i don't see uh, that kind of a connection what i mean uh, india russia cooperations is is somewhat bilaterally it is different when we are talking about chabahar and uh, i mean i i really i really i don't know what else you wanted to say but i i don't see that linkage here when you say india russia iran unless it is uh, instc that we we are talking about 
Thank you, ma'am. Uh, it has been a really engaging one hour, 10 minutes uh, discussion we had on this uh, topic of, uh, of impo uh, great importance to all of us. The complexity of the uh, project as well as the bilateral, international, or regional dynamics uh, is well reflected in the kind of, uh, reflected in the questions that have been posed by the, uh, the, the, the gathering in this virtual room. Uh, uh, I'm sure that all of us will move out of this virtual room with a lot more questions, you know, being raised to ourselves with regard to, again, the Quark Maya that uh, we have been talking about uh, with regard to this project uh, for the last many years. And uh, I really thank you, ma'am, for taking out time to be with us this afternoon, this evening, rather. And also uh, the audience from different parts of the world, not only from India, but from different parts of the world who stayed put during the entire discussion and uh, be with us and for posing all the questions. Uh, with these few words, I hand over to Professor Kumar Swami for the last few words. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you.